there is no magic threshold. It's kind of like there's no magic number of cigarettes that you can smoke with no consequences. Imagine if you could smoke 9,999 cigarettes and you would be 100% fine. And then, but if you just smoke one more, that would give you lung cancer. We know that that's ridiculous. We know that there's no magic number, but the more cigarettes you smoke, the greater the impacts on your lungs and the greater the risk of developing something serious like emphysema or lung cancer. In the same way, we know that the more carbon we produce and the faster we produce it, the more dangerous the impacts. Back in 1992, almost every country in the world got together and agreed to stabilize the levels of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system. But the problem is what's dangerous? Some would say that we've already reached it. If they live on crumbling permafrost in the Arctic, if they live in low-lying coastal areas or islands that are already being inundated by sea level rise, they would say it is already dangerous. But for others, especially people who live at higher elevation in richer countries with more resources at their disposal, if the price of food doubles, if their insurance costs triple, they can afford to pay it. For those people, they might say, oh, well, it's not dangerous yet. So that's why the world spent 25 years arguing over what was dangerous before finally coming together in Paris in 2015 and agreeing that they would limit global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius and pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to one and a half degrees. Now, are these magic numbers? No, they're not. If we end up at 1.499 degrees, it doesn't mean that everything is totally fine. People are already suffering the impacts today. If we end up at 2.01 degrees, it doesn't mean that it's all over. The world is ending. We're going to hell in a handbasket. We might as well eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. No. What we know scientifically is the more carbon we produce, the greater the risks. And the flip side of that, of course, is the more carbon we reduce and the faster we do so, the better off we all are. There is no magic threshold. Some amount of impacts are too late to avoid because they are already here or they've become inevitable. It's kind of like we've been smoking a pack of cigarettes for years and decades and some lung damage is already permanent. But we know, and I know this for sure because this is what I study, that there is a world of difference between a future where we continue to depend on fossil fuels versus a future where we wean ourselves off fossil fuels as soon as possible. And the difference is not the survival of our planet. The planet will still be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. The difference is the survival of human civilization as we know it, and particularly the survival of the poorest and most vulnerable. So now you may have seen headlines that are saying that carbon emissions this past April were 17% lower at the global scale compared to where they were the year before. But you've also probably seen headlines saying that this dip in air pollutants and in carbon emissions is just temporary. Because as the quarantine passes, they shoot right back up again. In fact, that's already happening in China. So the total impact on overall carbon emissions is likely to be pretty much negligible. It's as if, because again, what matters is total carbon, right? It's as if we've been putting a brick on a pile every month since the dawn of the industrial era. And month by month by month, that brick has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger until now we're putting a monster brick on the pile every month. And then for one month, that brick was 17% smaller. And in the next month, it's right back up to its regular size. So you can see how the carbon emission reductions as a result of the pandemic are not going to have a long-term effect on climate action. So then you might say, well, but look at what we did. We shut down the entire economy, threw people out of work, children couldn't go to school, caused enormous suffering in some of the poorest places in the world, which is ongoing today. We did all of that, and all we did was put a single 17% smaller brick on the pile. Does that mean it's hopeless that we can never fix climate change? No, in fact, exactly the opposite. Why? Well, because these reductions were achieved through completely non-sustainable ways. What does non-sustainable mean? It means we can't sustain it long-term. We can't shut down the economy, throw people out of work, keep children out of school, um, you know, fine or imprison people for leaving their homes. We can't live that way long-term. Those changes are not sustainable. But here's the thing. 
Imagine if that 17% reduction in global emissions had been achieved through sustainable methods like what? Like increasing efficiency, replacing fossil fuels with clean energy, and changing our behavior. Imagine if the carbon emission reductions had been accomplished through sustainable methods. We would be almost halfway, let's be generous and say 40%, 40% of the way to our 2030 goal in a matter of six weeks. That is astounding. So if anything, this gives me hope that when disaster really stares us in the eye, we can act and our actions truly do make a difference. But that brings us to our last question. So in that transition to a clean energy economy, the concept of a just transition is key because there's many areas where the entire economy of that town is based on extraction of oil and gas or coal, and many of those very people and their families have disproportionately paid the price. As my friend Marianne Hitt writes, talking about mountaintop removal coal mining in Appalachia, where they literally cut the tops off the mountains to get the coal out, that pollutes the local water, leading to increased rates of everything from birth defects to cancer among the very families who are working in those mines. How can we ensure a just transition? This does have to be central to our transition at the local level for cities, for regions, and for the country. And the good news is there are organizations um, in Canada, um, in the US, in the UK, and more that are working on the concept of a just transition. And in the response to the pandemic, we've seen some of this. We've seen people saying you have to account for your climate impacts in order to get the uh, the loans from the government. We've seen in Canada, for example, they're actually creating new jobs for out-of-work oil and gas workers since the price of oil fell so low, capping off all old oil wells that are leaking methane into the atmosphere. Not everyone will accept what's offered, but it should be offered to everyone. Because we're only going to reach that better world if we don't leave people behind. 